Cool stuff happening this weekend. Uh, one is um, this is one week after the one year anniversary of Jeremy and Christine. <laughs> or also known as Andy and Felicia's uh, first wedding anniversary. <laughs> As far as one day late. One day late. The thing is, I never signed the the certificate for like another so week. So technically, um, anyway, we'll, we'll get we'll, that's another sermon altogether. Um, also, uh, this is MJ and Felicia's birthday. That's our hero again. Isn't that sweet? Um, did you guys not know that? Because that's. We knew. We're kind of like this. Okay. 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 Um, but I heard that you guys didn't figure that out until you lived together. Get your stories straight, people. I think, like, I'm really bad at birthdays. It's alright. It's alright. Happy birthday. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> Listen to MJ. Happy birthday. Um, also, uh, Baby Linville came last night. Um, the picture, there's one picture on Facebook of her, like, crying. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like a little tiny Emily scream. I think, Jeremy, did you put... Holy Rock Yeah. Yeah, it's like a microphone. Yeah. Yeah, like a microphone. Maybe it's a premonition. Uh, so kind of a cool weekend, a big weekend. Uh, hope that you guys are having a good weekend. Hope you guys had a good Mother's Day. And uh, and if you know if you're not able to uh, share with your mother, then remember how amazing your mom is. And uh, nevertheless, here we're a week beyond, and now I get to be the guy who shares with you. And I think it'd only be appropriate if we talk about all the things in the world that have overtaken our world and uh, what that has to do with you. So here's what I want you to do in your bulletin. Pull out your little card, and uh, we're going to have you do something a little bit strange. Um, Chris was going to tap dance, but instead I've chosen this as, a, as kind of an alternative. Um, on your card, I want you to write the, the number 25 on your card. 25. 2, 5, 25. Where on it? I don't care. Okay. I'm going to leave that up to you. I'm just going to let go of control there and allow you to write it wherever you choose. It'll be your choice, 25. And um, I'll get back to that 25 thing in a little bit. I'm going to move this mic down a little bit because I think it's kind of popping a little bit. Is that better? Um, and I was, um, yesterday was the baby shower, I think, for Megan Dutton. And uh, so Tammy went to the baby shower, and she was telling about all the former New Lifers who were there and kind of celebrating together, which was really kind of cool. But it got us kind of reminiscing about times past, and it occurred to me all the changes that had taken place and how this incoming freshman class is, com I mean, I think they would have been born, what, 93, 94? 95. Yeah, some of you are going, oh my gosh, some of you are going, it's not that bad. <laughs> Three. Um, but, you know, when you think about that, how is the world different now from what it was back in 93 or 94? And I was thinking there's one thing that's happened about that time when they were born, that literally changed everything that you guys know about your lives. In fact, the people who are coming in next year as freshmen will not have known life without it. Does anyone know what it is? The internet. The internet, yeah. The, I mean, it was around beforehand, but it became mainstream right there in the early 90s and into the mid-90s. And, you know, when I first got on, it was dial-up and, you know, it would take forever and, and all that. But that's when it became mainstream. Do you guys know that 2 billion people are on the internet? Two billion people have access and are using the internet on a regular basis. That's almost 30% of the world's population. Think about that. One little tiny invention, and literally it's so big that everybody gets impacted by it. I remember when I was in the mid-90s, I didn't have a computer. And so everyone was talking about the internet, like, oh, you've done this, you've done the World Wide Web. And you know, I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And I don't think I care because I don't have a computer, so why would I even need that? You guys are probably don't remember that. And the, and the kids come in next year, the 18-year-olds won't have known life without it. And to me, it just seems so weird because I remember life prior, and maybe some of you guys do. So it's just unique. It was the one invention that literally changed everything. And with that came social networking stuff. So I remember Facebook, I thought that was just a college thing. And so I'm, I'm, always, I'm like, I'm not doing Facebook. That's the dumbest thing ever. It's just a bunch of college students. And, and you know, I don't want to be on, I mean, with all our students on there, I don't want to be on that. And then one of the New Life students made an Ed Travers page and started making posts. And then I'm thinking, well, I'm 
I'm not going to let someone else make my post. I'm going to be the one. And then I had to ask a student, hey, will you help me figure this thing out? So they had to make a page for me. Anyway, Facebook. Does anyone have an idea how many people use Facebook? Just guess. One million? One million? That's not even close. It's 1.1 billion. 1.1 billion people use Facebook. Think about that. If How many of you guys, your parents are on Facebook? Is that weird for you guys? Is it strange? <laughs> I can just imagine what that must be like for you guys. Because I remember when I first got on Facebook, I thought, oh my gosh. A bunch of college students are going to think it's so weird that I'm 40 years old and I've got a Facebook page and I'm like typing on their posts. and I mean, it's just weird. And then all of a sudden people's parents were getting involved and, you know. But here's the thing. I kind of had this attitude like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to respond to this stuff. I'm just going to, you know, this stuff just happens. It's, that's not who I am. And then you kind of get overtaken by it like a flood, you know. Even to not respond to Facebook, you have to literally say, I'm not doing that, in order to not be on Facebook now. And then, a couple years later, comes Twitter. Uh, Twitter is just a small outfit. It's just like a little startup company, evidently. How many people do you think are using Twitter on a regular basis? Let me guess. I'll give you a hint. It's much smaller. It's like a little startup company compared to some of these things. Anyone have an idea? Twitter. 200 million. 200 million. Yes, head on. <laughs> Did you buy a lottery ticket last night, the Powerball? I should have. Dang it. She was researching that all night. Was she? She was like, Ted's probably going to do this tomorrow. Yeah. 200 million. 200 million. 200 million. Do you know who the top followed person is? Anyone have a guess? Where are you Obama. Lady Gaga. Obama and Lady Gaga are in the top 10. Well, who'd you say? Justin Timberlake. Justin Timberlake is number like 20. Yeah. No, 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 he's number 10. Kim yeah. Kardashian is in there. Uh, and Travis is not. Michael Jackson. Michael. Michael. Oh, Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber is number one. Oh. That's what Tara said. Oh. You said that? No. That's not true. Oh, you said it. You guys said it. How many people do you think listen to his little tweets? He tweets an average of three a day. How many people do you think listen to his little. You follow him, don't you, Taylor? <laughs> you see. You're really defensive right now. Is there something going on? I think it's hilarious that anyone has to know. I know, it is hilarious. How many people do you think listen to his little three tweets a day? Anyone have a guess? However many young women are in that too. 39 million people. 39 million people listen to his tweets, his little three tweets a day. Isn't that crazy? That's more than, uh, more than the president, which I can imagine. I would, I would probably want to hear what he has to say. Um, but the president probably isn't really the president. He and Justin Bieber is really Justin Bieber, probably. You think so? Like Barack Obama, obviously, I'll tweet. Yeah, I have to do it for my son. Sorry. <laughs> he just blew my whole mind, Jeremy. And the sermon's kind of messed up now. Cross up to 25 on your sheet. Okay, just kidding. Um, so listen, here's the thing. When, I, when I'm looking back at all this, here's what's impossible to miss. Something happened that literally changed everything in our way of life. It changed the culture. And to not respond to it is your response. One thing happened, which led to another, and literally everything gets changed. To not respond is the response. Most people do respond to it in a way that they join it. And the reason I bring it up is because we're in the middle of a series. Andy and I were talking, and Andy had this idea for the series called the Twitter Gospel. And the idea is to look at the Gospel of Mark, which the Gospel of Mark is, it's really the shortest and most to the point. There's not a lot of uh, detail to a lot of the writings in the book of Mark. So we, we came up with this idea to read between the headlines. And that's what happens when you have a tweet. You know, It's just really just kind of a statement or uh, you know, something really short. You kind of have to figure out what the person's thinking or saying as a result. Um, and that's kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at Scripture from the book of Mark. And trying to figure out, if Mark were tweeting, what would he have said? How can we read between this and learn from it? So here we are five years ago. We couldn't have preached the Twitter gospel. Because everyone would have said, what the heck is that? Right? But the fact that everyone here knows what it is and probably knows the logo means it's something that happened that has changed our culture. But here's the question. Has there ever been a life 
like Jesus that absolutely transcended culture where everyone had to respond to one man's life like Jesus. He literally, his life changed everything. And even if you brought a friend today who like says, oh, I don't even care about this whole thing. It's all a big hoax. Their life has been impacted by Jesus. They would have to agree with me that even the calendar is set up based around his life. The holidays we celebrate here in America, you know, around his life, everything you know in your culture has overtones of religion and really lean back to Jesus in his life. Everybody responds to Jesus. And so what I want to do, I want to look at the scripture in the book of Mark, chapter 3, and it's really kind of a small section, and I want to read it, and I want to look at the early response to his ministry. Think back, you know, okay, when Facebook first started, what was the response? And now, of course, you know, everyone's on Facebook. It's, you know, in Jesus' ministry, what was the response? What does that have to do with our life today? And what is it that he actually wants from us? What, is it, what kind of response is Jesus expecting from our life? So turn to Mark 3, and I'm going to pray for us that, uh, that this will kind of sink in tonight and that God will get his message through uh, in spite of my, uh, my silly jokes. So um, God, I ask that somehow that uh, you would help us see what you see, what you are intending for us to know tonight. I pray for your spirit to be here, for your spirit to guide us, uh, for your spirit to soften our hearts. Um, I do pray that, that I would share the word like I'm supposed to, uh, but I pray, Lord, for, for your spirit to connect to people in here that, uh, that they would capture what it is you're trying to say. And they would connect to you and worship you as a result. And you may me pray. Amen. All right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read through this passage, and I'm going to kind of break it down. Because in the passage, um, it doesn't really say a whole lot of detail, like I said before. And so I'm going to kind of try to pick it apart and help, help you know, kind of figure out what is it that, that Mark would have said through tweets. Um, if you kind of go back through chapter 1 and 2 and, and into 3, you know Andy shared, uh, you know, Jesus had come on the scene. He had gathered his disciples to him that were his apostles or his, like, chief guys. And then he chose one guy who was a tax collector to be on his team, which is a social, uh, like, suicide. I mean, you just don't do that. There were sinners and tax collectors. They had their own name. And so he picks Matthew. Then he goes and has a party at Matthew's house. And kind of the big message was, you know, in our lives, who do we... Who are we not willing to hang out with? And what would Jesus do? You know, how, how do we invite people into our lives that uh, we would normally overlook? Now, what happened was, Jesus starts, you know, in his ministry, in Mark, what you're going to see is he's constantly teaching, he's constantly healing, and he's casting out demons. That's really the main things that he does in the book of Mark. And what happens here is he heals a guy on the Sabbath. The Pharisees, who are the religious leaders, kind of catch one of all this. They see what happens, and they are absolutely mad. Okay, and here's where it picks up in chapter 3, verse 6. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and the, lake, and the large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told the disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, and so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the, or whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. So what I want to do, I want to look at this passage and break it down into four basic responses uh, that we can see from the passage to help us get an idea of how it was that people were responding to Jesus at first. Okay? Um, the first one um, you have is hate. And, and let me just kind of give you an idea. In Mark 3, 6, what happens is the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And I thought, well, if Mark were going to tweet that, he might tweet something like this. Hate when new rabbis challenge old rules at the Pharisees. Hashtag save us out of um, <laughs> I had a little help with that. I'm not going to say who. But nevertheless, here's what's going on. When you read in this passage, the Pharisees are the religious rulers, right? You kind of know that. I'm sure you've heard that before. If you've been anywhere near a church or anywhere near the Bible, in that culture, the Pharisees were your top elite leaders. What you may not realize, and you'd have to do a little research to find out, is that there had been a series of people that had risen up in that culture who claimed to be the Messiah. At that time, obviously Israel was under the rule of Rome, and so they were really anxious to have a Messiah. The Pharisees kind of saw it fit to say, okay, we're going to be in charge of that, and we're going to squash out these false messiahs. Okay? Jesus actually mentions one, or it's, it's mentioned in the New Testament, 
But literally, um, this is something that you know they thought it was their job to get rid of these false messiahs. The fact, though, that they're plotting with the Herodians, you have to read between the lines here, because the Jews who actually were the Herodians, they were people who had literally connected to Herod, and they were like his followers or his leaders. Herod was a Jewish man who was the king of Israel, and he was given his job by Rome. So it was more of a political thing. He was given the job by Rome for political reasons, and uh, the Herodians were basically his followers. Does that make sense? Everyone got that? Okay. The fact that the Pharisees were connecting with them to plot says a lot about the Pharisees. That would be like um, you plotting with someone you can't stand in order to achieve some gain. So think about that. Think of someone who is like your enemy, you know, maybe someone like a coworker that you hate, but you know, you guys plot together to overtake your boss. This is pure hate. The response the Pharisees and the Herodians had was hate. And that is a typical response that you see throughout the New Testament to Jesus' early ministry. The second one, found in, in Mark 3, 7 through 9, here's what it says. Jesus withdrew and his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. They heard of all he was doing, so people from all over the place started going to him. Okay? So I started thinking, okay, why? Why was he being followed? And the word that came to mind was fascination. And so I thought, okay, what would Mark tweet if uh, he was tweeting what's going on in Jesus' early ministry? Um, Jesus trends higher than Bieber at Justin Bieber uh, more than a believer, which I assume those are his followers or believers. Um, People are coming from all over. Think of how small the area is. And so if something big is going on, and everyone's coming from everywhere to see him, huge crowds, to the point where he couldn't even, you know, he, had to find, he had to get into a boat to keep up from people like coming up on him. Everyone's coming to him. The question is why? Well, there, there would be the messianic expectations of the people. So if you're living under that oppression back then, and you really don't have freedom, and you hear that there's a Messiah on the scene, you might think, well, who's this guy? You might just be, you know, like someone else is going and you're bored. You know, you heard about this cool movie, so you want to go see the movie. Whatever. Maybe you heard, uh, you know, about The Great Gatsby last week and how cool the movie is, and so maybe you went out and saw The Great Gatsby because of the big promo. Um, Did anyone do that? Anyone see Gatsby this week because of Andy's promo? No. No. Andy was going to get like 50 bucks from the people of Gatsby. Anyway, I'm just kidding. Um... It could be fascination. It could just simply be, this is something that's going on, and, you know, you follow the crowd. But they were fascinated. They wanted to see what he had to say. It could have been messianic expectations. It could have been curiosity. It could have been excitement. But they were flocking to him. And he was becoming extremely popular, and this was making the Pharisees very, very intimidated. The third one, what happens in verse 10 is that for he had healed many, so that those with disease were pushing forward to touch him. And basically, you have all these sick people who are coming to Jesus out of desperation. And he's healing everyone. And so I thought, what would Mark tweet if he was tweeting this one? Hospitals closing down at rapid rates at New Doctor in Town. Hashtag healings. The the interesting thing about Jesus' ministry, and as you read it in the New Testament, and if you study any history or study some of Josephus' writings, this is the thing you're going to find. No one disputed the healings. It's not like today. You know, there are these faith healers that are out there that supposedly heal people of certain diseases, but they're very disputed. People put on, you know, shows and documentaries about how they're, you know, they're not doing what they say they do. People dispute it all the time. I honestly can't tell you whether it's real or not. I don't know. I can say, tell you this, that no one disputed the healings that Jesus was doing. We'll talk more about that next time. But it's interesting that in this situation, they were plotting to kill him in spite of the fact that he was healing people. So here's what you have to ask yourself. Why were sick people going to him? It'd be desperation. Absolute desperation. Think of the people in your life who you've watched who are really sick that continued down that road. A few weeks ago, Jason was sharing the story of, you know, they literally tore the ceiling apart 
to drop in the person in front of Jesus. That's desperation. Desperation that somehow this is the person that you can hope in. That's a typical response to Jesus' early ministry. And the thing about desperation is that everyone in this room can identify with what it's like to be desperate in some way, shape, or form. And let me tell you what I've learned about people who are not people of faith. Everyone, if they're desperate enough, prays. Everyone prays. I've, I've had so many people come in and out of my life who have said, you know, I don't want God. But it's amazing sometimes that because I represent something in their mind, when they're struggling or desperate, they'll call me. In particular, I have a brother who I've talked about many times who is not a real follower of Jesus. He, he might say he's a Christian, but he doesn't follow Jesus at all. Three times in our adult life, he has called me in desperation. He had a best friend who had leukemia. He called me late at night and says, I need you to pray for me and pray for my friend. His wife, after giving birth to his youngest son, had some kind of a tear on the inside, and I don't understand all that's going on there, but she's continuing to bleed, and they can't stop it. And there was a real good chance she was going to bleed out, and he was scared to death. And he's asking me to pray. Several years later, the same son who had grown up a little bit, he was probably five or six years old, had gone into a diabetic coma. And my brother calls me, please pray for me. Please pray for me. You know, even people who are not religious, if they're desperate, there's something inside them that tells them, pray, talk to God. Because there's something we're built with that inside of us to know Him. And that pride that keeps us from turning to Him, that's in there, I get that. But desperation kind of overrides pride. And that's what you see as an early response to Jesus' ministry. You see this desperation. And lastly, I struggle with this word quite a bit, because here's, here's what happened in verse 11 and 12. And this, these two verses are really amazing. If you think about them, it's one of the reasons why I love reading the Bible. You guys should always read your Bible. If you don't, you're missing out on things like what you're about to read. Pretty amazing little verse. Here's what happens. And this is, this is actually kind of cool. Verse 11. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and, and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict orders not to tell who he was. So think about that for a second. And because I really, I, I spent a lot of time reading about this, this little, these two verses. I talked to a bunch of pastors this week. I read commentaries. I looked for scholars that kind of looked at Because I kept thinking, why would these demons cry out, that's him, the Son of God? Because Jesus hadn't even said that at this point. Why would they say that? So, kind of, you know, the scholars have two different viewpoints on the whole thing, okay? In, in chapter 1 of Mark, it's verse 34. Here's what happens. It, it makes the same statement that he had cast out a demon and he had commanded the demon, don't tell who I am, right? The, the scholars basically say, and most of them land on this side, they call it the messianic secret. That there was a rhythm or a time frame in which Jesus was going to communicate that he was the Messiah, and as we go through Mark, you're going to see that kind of play out. That he's at first saying, no, 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 no. He, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. And then finally, he says to Peter, who do you say that I am? He says, well, you're the Messiah. And he's like, you got it. And then later on, in front of you know, Pilate, he actually answers the question, are you the Messiah? Yes, yeah, that's the truth. So there are a lot of the scholars think that he was just going in rhythm, in time, and this was just not the time for him to communicate that he was the Messiah. The other scholars say this. Jesus didn't want demons declaring who he was because he didn't want their testimony. So let's think about that for a second. Do you want the person you don't respect most to communicate your praises? He doesn't want demons out there shouting out who he is because he doesn't want them, doesn't need their testimony. That's not what his plan is. In fact, his plan as it carries out is that he picks us who have never seen him to worship him and to praise him. That's the plan. Blessed are those who have believed and not yet seen. Either way, and I cannot tell you that I know for sure either way what those two reasons are that they cried out. This is the question. Why? What was it they were doing? And the only thing I could come up with is the word respect. And I battled back and forth with the word fear, but I came up with respect. And here's what I think Mark might have tweeted um, at this moment. You are the Son of God at Jesus' true identity, not just a carpenter. 
he was communicating, this is the true identity, these demons were communicating this is the true identity of Jesus. Why? And the only, think, of, think of it like this. Let's say, um, you know, uh, you're committing a crime and the cops bust in. Cops! I'm going to talk more about this in my next sermon. But this is a positional thing. You guys know the story of demons. You have, way back in the beginning, God created all the angels. He created Lucifer. Lucifer is the chief angel, right? And he leaves, and a third of the angels go with him. Those are considered demons or evil spirits. They then are sent down here, and they literally have kind of the run of the place. And Satan is considered the prince of the world, right? Prince of the power of the air. And his demons are underneath his authority. And for the first time in history, something dramatic happens. The Son of God comes walking on the scene. When you see someone who is more powerful than you, who pulls rank over you, you know it. Let me, let me just give you an example of a time in my life. This is going to make a little bit of sense, but maybe not a lot. Um, this is one of the top ping pong paddles in the world. That might be a stretch. Nevertheless, this, this like, I haven't had this ping pong paddle for like 20 years. This, at the time, back in like 93, was about $120 for a ping pong paddle. Now, I would never pay $120 for a ping pong paddle, but my company was going out of business, and so I got it for free. And uh, so I have this free, really sweet ping pong paddle. And it may mean nothing to you, but this is a sweet paddle. It has the largest sweet spot of most ping pong paddles that you got. It's an incredible material. And you know, Anyway, um, I first started playing ping pong when I was a little kid. My parents had a ping pong table that was made off a piece of wood, and we had a little fake net up, and we used to like hit a, you know, a ball cross, you know, because, you know, we weren't very good. But when I was in, you know, for like 8, 9, 10, maybe 11 years old, um, we moved in this apartment complex, and in the apartment complex there was a recreation center, and the recreation center had a ping pong table, a really good one, and they had really good paddles and everything, okay? And, um, you know, I of course didn't really know how to play, but some of my buddies did. And so we would go down there and play every day. Well, a lot of college guys would come into the recreation center, and so I'm, here I am, this like 11, 12-year-old kid, and I'm playing these college guys every day. And they were really good, and they were teaching me how to, you know, how to hold the paddle, how to serve, you know, how to put spin, how to put English on. I mean, all the stuff. I'm learning all the stuff at an early age. And then, when I'm in middle school, in sixth, seventh grade, sixth grade, our class had this tournament, a ping pong tournament, and I won the ping pong tournament. You're looking at a champion ping pong player. And then I changed schools after sixth grade, went to seventh grade in Columbus Public Schools, and we had a tournament for the seventh and eighth grade. And if you won the seventh grade tournament, you played the champion of the eighth grade tournament. You're looking at a two-time <laughs> ping pong champion. Let me tell you something. That's right. Okay, maybe not. That. Good at something is relative to your competition. Let me explain. So I thought I was the greatest ping pong player on the planet until years later I met this girl, started dating this girl, and she, you know, her brothers and her like cousins would all get together at her grandpa's house. Her grandpa had this incredible like spread down in his basement and he had a sweet ping pong table and you know, so we would play. And grandpa would play and he would he would just play and he would beat all the guys and I would get and I would beat all the guys. I used to destroy her brothers and like her cousins. I, mean, I was like thinking, I'm the man, you know, right. Two top taken. Until grandpa gets up to play. He played everyone left handed. He was right handed. So he starts playing me and left handed, and he's kinda of beating me, but I'm hanging with him a little bit, and then he switches to his right hand. When you know someone's better than you, you, you really, you just, you just know in your mind, like, oh, I really am not as good as I thought I was. I was thinking, I'm the, and he was so, here's the deal, he was a retired Air Force colonel who spent 10 years in Asia, and on his free time, he played ping pong with all the people who were incredible players, and he's, he's just that good. I felt so overmatched, I'm like, I'm not <laughs> He was beating me left-handed, and when he did right-handed, he, there was no shot I could hit that he couldn't spin back at me or hit with English. I literally could not play the guy. I'm, I'm really only an average ping pong player. Listen, here's the deal. In this situation, there's a respect that happens when you realize you're overmatched. Something happened for the first time in history in this passage. The king of kings walked on the earth, and the enemy, who had no one that could really defeat him, knew he was overmatched, and they backed down. That's going to play into the next sermon, but I want you guys to remember there's a respect when you realize who Jesus is, when you realize his real identity. 
So then, here's the thing. What's a similar response of our generation? And I, I group this into three things. The first one is the religious leaders. They had hate, right? Uh, the crowds, they were the ones who were fascinated and desperate. And then the evil spirits really had respect or fear, depending on how you look at what their response was. But let's look at the first one. Hate. Do people hate Jesus today? I don't know if you've ever brought up Jesus. You can talk about God. You can be with your friends and talk about God, and you kind of get some anonymity, and you're kind of cool with that. Bring up Jesus. Watch how it changes conversations with people. I don't know why. It, um, you guys have heard me ramble on about Tim Tebow because I, I like the guy. He's a quarterback in the NFL, or was in the NFL, and this incredible quarterback who loves Jesus, and his one mistake in life is to actually tell people how much he loves Jesus. And so the commentators and the coaches literally slam this guy over and over and over again. People on The View were talking about him and about whether or not he's going to you know, lose his virginity and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they're literally hating on this guy for his beliefs. Two weeks ago, a guy named Jason Collins. You guys know who Jason Collins is? I'm going to tell you something. Nobody knows him because he's not that good. He's an NBA player, so he's great in context, great basketball player, just an average player in the NBA. He comes out and says that he's a homosexual man. <laughs> the, all the commentators start talking glowingly of how he's so courageous. He's such a hero. Your president sends out a press release through the White House about how he admires the courage of Jason Collins. And that he is a hero for people. How do you explain that? Jason Collins comes out just for a sexuality issue and is, he's a hero. Tim Tebow is literally railed on simply because he believes in Jesus. You know what the word says in John 15? You guys have probably heard this before, but this is Jesus talking to his guys in verse 18. It says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Hate is a very real response that's just the same today as it was back then. The second one is, is the crowds. They, remember, they had fascination and desperation. Um, this is what I want to say about that. If you think about it, it's self-serving. If you're fascinated or you want something from him, you're basically saying, okay, I want to see what, what do you got for me. If you're going to be the Messiah, you know, campaign for me. Let me see if do you have something. Are you going to protect me? Are you going to feed me? Are you going to... And the people who are desperate, they're looking at Jesus and saying, can you heal me? It's self-serving. Do you have people who have self-serving in their response to Jesus today? Yeah. You're looking at them. You look around. Look in the mirror. There is no one in this room who didn't come to God first with an idea of God, what do you have for me? God knows this. Psalm uh, um, 34, 8 says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Because God knows who you are. He knows how he made you. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 2, and just the first part there, it says, Now that you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, crave pure spiritual milk. Crave more than that. You're not supposed to stay at that baby level. But listen, all of us start out the same way. Self-serving. We go to God. God, you have something for me. So if you're sitting here and you're thinking, yeah, I just want to know if God can fix my... Will God forgive me? Will, you know, will God save me? Can he fix that? Can he understand that is a very normal response to who Jesus is? Lastly, the evil spirits. And this is the thing that, about them that I kind of struggle with. It's that they absolutely knew who he was. They knew it. You didn't have to convince them. These were not atheist demons. In, in James chapter 2, verse 19, it says this, You believe there is one God? Good. Even demons believe that and shudder. Why don't demons, who know who he is, fall on their face and worship him? And decide not just to acknowledge that it's true, but actually say, I will follow you with my life. Why is that? And do you see a similar response in our generation today? People who say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in the cross. Yeah, I believe Jesus did all that stuff. And then not actually follow him with their life. Do you see that today? All the time. All the time. The responses you see in Mark 3 are not that much different than what you see in people's response to Jesus today. 
Because people are not changing. People aren't getting better. People aren't getting smarter. People aren't realizing how amazing Jesus is in and of themselves. And this is the thing about the gospel. The gospel stands as a moment in time that changes everything about your life. Okay, we've all heard it, and I'm sure you could say, oh yeah, of course I believe that. You have friends who probably would say that, and you look at your friends and say, why don't you follow him? Even if you're not a believer, even if you're sitting, you know, you're like, I'm not even sure this is all real, you would have to conclude, if the gospel is true, it deserves more of a response than hate or self-serving or, you know, just an acknowledgement. If the gospel is true, that means that God made you to be in a relationship with him, and we all turn our backs on him, and decide to go our own way. I'm going to do my thing my way. And yet he loves us anyway, rescues us from that, gives us a way to pay the penalty for all of that so that we can turn back and be in a relationship with him. If that's true, it demands a bigger response than just acknowledgement. And you don't even have to be religious to know that if the gospel is true, it deserves your everything. It deserves everything in your life. If, if right now, Let's say some guy comes in with a gun, and some, he's crazy. He just loves to kill pastors. You know, He hates Jesus. And he comes in, and I see the guy with the gun. Chris sees my eyes. He goes, oh, my gosh. Chris gets up. Okay, Eric you know, does a backflip behind him, but he gets off a shot right before Eric takes him out and whacks him. Okay? Cause I don't know if you guys know that Eric is a ninja. But nevertheless, at that moment, the bullet comes forward. Chris jumps in front of the bullet to save my life. Okay? How do you think I would live my life in light of Chris? If Chris lived, here's what would happen. My kids would know Chris. Every time we walked around Chris, my kids would say, that's Chris. That's the one. Oh, that's the one who saved Daddy's life. That's right. They would honor him. Everyone would know Chris. Of course, Eric, I'm sorry. But he took a bullet, though. <laughs> I appreciate that. Plus, you're trained. I mean, you're expected to do that kind of stuff. If Jesus really did die for your life, doesn't it deserve your life? Doesn't the gospel demand a bigger response than just, yeah, I'm, I just want you to bless my life, God? Doesn't it demand something larger than that? Doesn't it demand us laying down our lives saying, okay, I will honor you with my life? So here's what I was thinking about that. Um, in Romans 1, 16 and 17, I'm going to read these verses to you guys. Just let these sink in. Or maybe even turn to them. And, you know, I know I've kind of rushed through those other verses, but turn to these ones, okay? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. In this letter to, to the church at Rome, Paul's writing and he has this to say about the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The response that God actually wants for our life, in light of Jesus, is to live our lives by faith. In light of the gospel, that we would live our lives by faith. I was having a conversation with this big dude named Sam. Sam was at New Life years ago, and Sam was from inner city Cleveland. He's a really big guy. He was only a teenager, to be honest with you, you know, when I met him. But he's a really big guy. He had dreads. He looked kind of street. And he looked like a man. Okay? He was a big fella. And, you know, he was an intimidating guy. I would talk with Sam, and I remember when he was starting to get Romans, you know, this chapter 1, verse 16, 17, into his heart. He was starting to become a little bit undone by the gospel. And I asked him, I said, Sam, what do you think this means to be ashamed of the gospel? He goes, well, I think if you're ashamed of the gospel, you know, you're not willing to share it with anyone. I said, so what you're telling me, Sam, is if you're not willing to share the gospel, you're actually ashamed of it? He goes, well, yeah. Here's a guy who had just really become acquainted with the gospel, who actually understood this passage pretty clearly. In his mind, if you're not willing to share it, you actually are ashamed of it. That's the question, I think, for us. Is do we live by the gospel? Do we live by faith? Are we more than just acknowledging it? And what I, what I want to say you know, to you is that, listen, if you're at a point in your life where you're like, I've just been acknowledging that it's true, is it worth your life? Would you turn your life over to the gospel? I think it's, it's pretty simple. You have to decide, I, I'm going to respond to Jesus by giving him my life. 
And to, to you, if, you, if you're here and you're like me, you're like, yeah, I've, I've, I've decided to live for Jesus. Let me give you an idea of something I'm praying about for this church. You know, we're, we're in the midst of, you know, the summer. And something that I've been, I've been praying about here recently is I've been praying that God would give us 25 freshmen this fall. 25 freshmen who would become undone by the gospel. There's nothing magical about the number. It's just something that I felt like was in my head and in my heart. What if God gave us 25 freshmen this fall who fell in love with Jesus? Whether they already know him or just getting to know him. If they were transformed by the power of the gospel. Why 25? In my mind, if 25 freshmen went through the years at OSU together, by the time they were ready to graduate, they are more than plenty to plant a church. And that's what we, that's our passion, is to see these people grow up in their faith, embrace the gospel, and then go out and live as ambassadors. And many of them might do it on another campus someday. And what I'm asking, if, if you would simply consider this week and this summer making it part of your prayer life, say, God, give this place 25 freshmen who will become undone by the gospel, become transformed by it. And if you start praying like that, and if we all pray like that together, Here's the deal. You and I are going to have to live it out in front of them because they're not going to get it on their own. We would actually have to embrace it in such a way that they see it in us. And that might spur one another as God starts to show off what he's doing as he starts to bring these people into the kingdom. So that's what I want to do. That's how I want us to pray and uh, what I want to challenge you guys with today. Um, so grab your little prayer cards and I'm going to give you just a couple quick announcements and then uh, they're going to come back up and lead us in a song, I think. And uh, maybe a tap dance, but I'm not positive about that since I was unclear about it earlier. I mean, it's perfect. It's going to be very difficult. But, so let me ask you something. What is your response to Jesus? Have you gone from acknowledging that this is true? Saying, all right, God, I'm going to give you my life. I'm not going to stay with just self-serving. I'm going to say, okay, God, I'm going to give you my life. Are you ready for that? This is where you talk to him and you say, God, yes, this is what I want. I want to turn around from just being a self-serving person to give my life to you to be selfless. Forgive me for what being a self-serving person. Forgive my sins. In light of what you've done by the cross, I'm giving you my life. And can I challenge... Everyone in the room, would you consider praying for 25 this fall? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for being a God who uh, comes after us. Um, you know how self-serving we all are, and yet you come after us anyway. God, I've, I've ministered to people who come to New Life who literally have hated you and turned into lovers of you. I've watched you do that with people. God, I pray that you would do that in all of us, that we would go from being self-serving people who really are kind of ashamed of your gospel to being people who embrace you by the power of your gospel and live for you and live by faith. God, I pray that we would be that type of people in this room. And I pray, God, that you would rescue 25 young people this fall and transform them by your power. Lord, that we get to watch it happen and we get to praise you as it's happening, God. In your son's holy name, amen. Amen.